Sorry. Is what? We can start. Oh yeah, yeah. You okay, yeah. we can start. Yeah, yes. sure. Hello, this is Ilinka Damian from Hyperliteratura, Romania's online literature magazine. We are here today with Gay Miller, poet, novelist, anthologist, essayist, and the list may continue, according to his Twitter account. Born and raised in Jamaica, but living nowadays in Scotland. Yeah. Hi Kay, nice to meet you. First of all, let's introduce you to the Romanian public. You were first published in 2006 with a book of poetry, Kingdom of Empty Bellies. Yeah. But when did you start writing and how was your road until now? How was my road? Eh? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that makes on sense. writing. On yeah. Um, I guess I was writing for a long time. Um, but my first book got published when I was really young. Eh? Um, so, so I was lucky in that way. I mean, I didn't have uh, it. It didn't take a long, long time. But um, I think I was always writing stories uh, in in my family. Um, my grandfather was a writer as well. Uh, I mean, he did. He never published uh, his life. He became a journalist for most of his life, um, and I think that was his one big regret that he couldn't that he didn't sit down and just write the book that he wanted to write but he wrote several stories um, so I guess that was always something in the family um, you know my grandfather the writer and and at the time Jamaica was becoming independent and he was friends with lots of that generation of Jamaican writers so for my father my father's godfather was you know one of the major Jamaican writers at the time and that was part of the scene um, but to be honest, I mean, though I was writing, I always, I was the opposite of my grandfather. I always imagined I was going to be a journalist and that's what I was trying to be. And it was only, almost accidentally that uh, journalism didn't work out, <laughs> but writing did, I mean, creative writing. Um, so yeah, so, so, so probably there's always something about, probably there's a, um, that journalistic impulse to document society. I, I don't know if that's there because of that, because that's where, that was my own road to writing. Does that answer? <laughs> yes, yes. So uh, it comes from the family? Yeah, partly. partly. I think, yeah. I, I don't know if these answers are ever, are ever completely true. I think, I mean, I, you know, I think we end up where we end up. And we try to look back and try to explain it, and and some of the answers are always half answers. They, they never completely get it, but that's one of the ways I'd answer that question. How I wrote it. If if you asked me another morning, I could tell you another story of how I came to writing. But <laughs> okay, but yeah. So, who do you consider your main influence amongst the well-known writers? Hmm. Um, Amongst the well-known writers, um, Toni Morrison. Uh, okay. There was something about. I mean, partly just what what kind of writing I'm drawn to, um, what what made me read it again. But I think it's her writing is extremely intelligent, but also it resists certain kind of gazes so if you're if you're writing literature from a small place um, who do you write that literature for and I think Toni Morrison grapples with that and I think she's I, I've always said it like this that my ambition is to write a large literature from a small place and that and so that means you're aware of different audiences, but do you do you write to that audience? Um, you know, Toni Morrison, growing up as a kind of southern black person, uh, I think she's always conscious of books that pandered to the larger American audience, and she did she never wanted to do that. She wanted to write a literature to the to the place where she came from, but that was still international in a way. And I guess I got a lot of lessons from her about about writing with integrity, about writing to a place with integrity and not 
not compromising for the larger audience, but still including them in a way. Um, so she was one influence. I mean, there, there, there's so many. I mean, again, Toni Morrison, Faulkner. Um, in the Caribbean, there are writers like Earl Loveless, like Lorna Goodison, like Derek Walcott, like Brathwaite. There are so many. But, but one of the things I always, I always say is that that's... I mean, well, well, your question is very specific amongst the major writers, but I'm always specific that... Yeah, I have a question also about uh, on uh, Jamaican writers. Yeah. Your favorite from the Caribbean or Jamaica. Yeah, uh, well, but some of those writers move between. Like a writer like Walcott, who is from the Caribbean, is both Caribbean and, you know, probably one of the greatest poets in English right now. Um, but also, I, I think, I think the way I always think of influence is what, what were some of the, inf what were some of the things that influenced my voice? What were some of the things that made me compose images the way I compose images, etc.? And those aren't always writers, and sometimes those aren't people with literary reputations at all. And I think the writer has to be open to all kinds of influences and you have to know how to translate those things to the page. And so there are several people who, you know, old, old women in Jamaica who used to speak at the market, um, who are as major an influence on my work as Toni Morrison was. And I think you have to put them side by side. Uh, and, uh, yeah. So, so yes, yeah, so, so, so I always try to privilege other, as I said, there are literary influences, but there are other influences that shape my voice. So, um, yeah. Yeah, so, um, that was my next question. Yeah. Uh, how much is your art influenced by national, ethnical issues and uh, typically Jamaican yeah. uh, background? All of these questions, they seem simple, but I realize how hard they are for me. <laughs> Um, if I could put it in this way, um, I write, I always write as a national, that I, I come from Jamaica and I write from the place that I come from. I don't believe in nationalism and I think writing has to resist nationalism because nationalism creates boundaries and it says who is in and who is out. But I think you have to write from the place that you come from and you have to be true to those influences. So I am both fiercely national but anti-nationalistic, if that makes sense. Yes, makes sense. Any kind of, yeah. Um, so, so yes, I do write from the place where I'm from and I believe in writing back to that place. Um, but, but expressions of like fierce national pride and you know, this is who we are. I don't believe in that. <laughs> it's a boundary. Yeah. And it's a, and it excludes. It's a mental boundary. Yeah. And it limits. Yeah. And and so in fact one of the ways that I think you that I believe one should write as a national writer is to write against the nationalistic discourse that's always out there. Mm -hmm. And it's the writer who has to do that. That says you're you're constructing this thing that this is what Jamaican is or this is what Caribbean is, and I want to challenge that. Um, and I think that's partly what I've always done. Um, so yeah, so, so I have a very conflicted relationship with yeah. Uh, I read about it in uh, in defense of Mas Joe on your blog. Oh right. <laughs> yeah, I read your blog. Uh -huh. uh, so. Uh, there, your opinion about uh, these influences are uh, there. You make a really clear and well put distinction between good literature that defies the boundaries of national heritage, uh, though this is the starting point. Uh -huh. uh, I came from this background, but my issues are international, right? And that mediocre literature, happy to use cliche characters and specific backgrounds. Mm -hmm. so, uh, and uh, that story about the girl in high school, All right. uh, it's really common. Yeah. Uh, you can find it also in Romania yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. on the same issue. Okay. <laughs> um, 
So what gives a national literature its international value? Uh, is it about um, issues that affect people regardless of their uh, background, like, uh, I don't know, inequalities yeah. or I, I, sadness I, right. or happiness? Yeah. Or, so what gives the value? of a national I, literature? That's probably your first question that I, I have no idea what the answer is. <laughs> um, and it's because um, I don't know if all literature should be international. I think all literature should be, should be written with integrity. Um, and I believe that there is there's things that, that only work in a national context. And that doesn't make it less than a work that works in an international context that work reaches to different audiences. Um, and, and by extolling a work only because it is international um, would make us not write a lot of the work that we really need to write and that we really need to write to different um, groups and different societies. I mean, you know, some work, and I have no idea why that some work just appeals, but I'm, I'm very suspicious of um, a writing that tries to be universal and probably that's just because if, if you come from a small place um, you always you always read work by that's that's written for to universal people but universal people never look anything like me and they never speak anything like me and and universal just becomes this word that privileges what the status quo is already um, and just some work does break out and, I, I, and, and I'd be happy you know, obviously every writer wants your writing to reach as many people as possible um, but I don't know if that's that's what I I set out to do as I said yeah I, I just believe in writing with integrity and trying not to exclude um, yeah, it's... So, it's about writing on a sincere level, on what you feel, on what you've seen, and about the lady in the marketplace and the people around you. Yeah, and... And somehow, if this applies to international, it's yeah. good, if not, it's the same. Yeah, and... And perhaps even the example that you gave is 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 an example of how that worked in telling the the story of that student. Yeah. I am telling a very national, specific, a very personal story. This just happened the other day, and yet suddenly you find it's international. Yes, it's yes. It, you know, um, <laughs> but you don't set out to write uh, this story that applies to everyone in the world. But if you write with uh, I think if you write with truth and you write with integrity and you write as almost as specific, almost as locally as you can, as specifically as you can, you find that the the more specific you are, the more international you are, and that sometimes that's why I'm saying that to write with integrity because some if, if you try to write that story for everyone, it doesn't you reach everyone. <laughs> yeah. But when you write that story about exactly what you know, exactly what happened. Then everyone recognizes it. Everyone goes, yeah, that that, yeah, that would happen exactly. In, a pattern yeah, in every situation. Exactly, um, and and so I wonder if the way to write internationally is not to look out but to look in. That I have to look inside Jamaica to write outside Jamaica. If, yeah, but if I look outside, my my perspective is too too wide. Too wide yeah, you lose yourself. Yeah, exactly. So. Yeah. Um, so I find that many nations have this sad or uncommon past that follows their people wherever they go. In Romania is the former communist regime, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, in Jamaica is the independence and yeah. other issues. How does a writer use this stigma? for it not to become a burden 
mm -hmm. and uh, also not to become an accusation of opportunism like uh, oh you're using that background to become famous and right yeah. so how do you use it uh, to be real but not a burden not uh, accusation mm -hmm. Well, again, I don't know. <laughs> um, by, yeah, again, I think we are made up with different histories, uh, and and clearly, a lot of our history is isn't pleasant to say the least. Um, but it it makes us who we are. Um, but I think. The writer has to say, or the good writer says, what hasn't been said already. Um, and therefore you have to resist all kinds of cliches. I, I, I think the much harder training for the writer is um, to think more deeply than others might think through something. And to think even through things more controversially. Um, and, and never to settle for the easy answers. So, um, so I don't know. I mean, I, I think when you come to writing, you, you, the good writing resists every cliche and it allows someone to think through something in a way that they didn't think through it before. Um, and, and once you're doing that, that's fine. And whether that's an accusation or not, uh, um, I find often that those things end up being an accusation of myself. So, so for instance, I mean, if we talk about Jamaica's history, which is, um, a lot of it is built on slavery, etc., etc. Um, you know, Walcott was one of the first people who, who asked, well, if my, I could take the role that, oh, you know, white English people were horrible because they did this and that to my great-grandfather. But what happens when, uh, in a situation like most Caribbean people, you had a great-great-grandfather who was black, but you also had a great-great-grandfather who was white. So that means the two people meet inside you, and you can't privilege one side of yourself and take that side and not accuse the other side of yourself who did the crime. And so you're taking an easy way out. You're, you're, you're not implicating yourself. Because I look mostly one color, that doesn't mean that all these races aren't meeting inside me and that I'm implicated in that history. Um, and that's a very difficult thing to say for people who wanted to take, the, to take the line that we are innocent, we are free, and we are angry at this past. That was a much more difficult truth to face. Um, and again, he was just resisting every cliche, and, but saying something very true. Uh, uh, but I think those are the only, only things worth saying, the things that we haven't said yet. And, and, and writers are always, or the good writers are always doing that. And, and to me, it, it would be that. It wouldn't be about not accusing or accusing. It would be, are you saying something that is true and that hasn't been said yet, and that needs to be said. Uh, one of my favorite Jamaican writers is a writer called Lorna Goodison. And one of the poems that made me start writing was a poem called Mother the Great Stones Got to Move, which is a, um, it's a, it's a kind of hymn in Jamaica that they sing in one church. But the poem begins, Mother one stone is wedged across the hole in our history. So it imagines this, this stone that is blocking the history and it says one stone is wedged across the hole in our history in this hole is our side of the story it is the half that has never been told some of us must tell it and i always believe that that that's your job your job is to tell the half of the story that hasn't been told um and bad writers tell the half that has been told already um and that's what you should never do yeah that's beautiful so yeah on a lighter yeah. <laughs> approach. Your latest book is A Light Song of Light. Yeah. Uh, and uh, for Romanian people, it is rather unknown. 
So please tell us about, uh, a bit about it as an intro for tomorrow's event. Okay, a light song of light. It actually had a book that came out yesterday. Can you believe? Um, but yeah, the light song of light. It's 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 my last book of poems, um, and it. My mother died a few years ago. Um, and that's pretty difficult because she was pretty young. She was, you know, in her sixties. Um, and I think one of the questions that I kept on wondering was, how do you, how do you face something that's very dark, and how do you compose out of that darkness a song of light? How do you sing a light song of light, even in? darkness uh, that's why the singer man yeah. is the central piece of exactly that he comes up to sing these songs but but the whole i think the whole book is trying to um in it, because i don't think it's a sad collection at all but it's it, it, it's trying not to turn away from the things that are dark but to say that i can face darkness and i can compose out of darkness a song of light um, I mean that that would be the way that I would distill that. I mean there are several poems, of course, but but all the poems are about light and about yeah. I, why do we sing? Why why do we sing when we sing? Um, and yeah, how how does such beauty come out of hard things? So it's like a cathartic catharsis. Yeah, probably in a way. Poem and music and yeah, the. The singer man is a strange that in of course on the side I do so much research um, for other things um, because I'm an academic on the side as well um, and I do do a lot of research in Jamaican culture so the singer man does come up as this a kind of shamanic figure in in Jamaica in the 1930s when they built roads the singer man would be the person who would who the government actually employed to sing songs while people were breaking stones and again it's the same thing that i mean just, just that the fact of being out there in the road in the blistering heat is a very dark thing but to have someone singing a song through the very hard task of breaking stones um, seemed very poetic to me and so he comes up in the collection a, a lot this singer man who begins to sing a song throughout um, the collection yeah. Yeah. So, uh, what are your next projects? <laughs> well, I just, as I said, I just had a book that came out yesterday in England, and that's a book of essays. Um, I guess if you read my blog, you see that I, yeah, I, I write non-fictionally a lot, and I try to think through a lot of things. So that was the next project. Um, the, the book I'm excited about that's coming out is in May and it's a new book of poems. And it's... Yeah, about the cartographer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it's called The Cartographer Tries to Map Away to Zion. Um, and yeah, that, that I'm just in the process of finishing. I mean, yeah, it's pretty much finished now. So that comes out in May. That's the next project. And for a long time, and I don't know how much longer I'll be working on it, probably at least another year and a half, I've been trying to write a new novel called August Town, which is, again, about Jamaica and about a man who, in, nine, in the 1920s in Jamaica, this, I mean, a very true story, this, this man called Alexander Bedward said he was going to fly, and he didn't, and there is, <laughs> clearly... Um, but there are some weird things that came out of that story that the big thing that came out of that in a weird kind of you know way is that in the aftermath of all of that I mean he was taken off to a asylum but Rastafari grows out of that moment um, and he's seen as one of the people who prefigured Rastafari it was his second in command who pretty much helped to start Rastafari when he was taken away so it's a huge moment in, in Jamaica's history. And I think even lots of Rastafari songs, if I had the wings of a dove or I'll fly away to Zion, that they, they hold within them the memory of Bedward. 
and and so I, I want to tell a story um, but in a weird way I want to tell a story from the perspective of someone who believed he could fly um, and that's been taking a long time to write so those are the next projects I work on too many things at the same time so you've written and you will write about Jamaica but do you think at uh, some point in your work you will cease to find inspiration in this background and develop a completely new way of writing? Uh, who knows? I mean, it could happen. I doubt it though. Um, and probably I'm just too stubborn. Like I. Um, I don't know if you could ever exhaust any place and and the idea that a place is so small that you could exhaust this literature um, I always resist that and again it's probably it comes from my ambition that I will that I think you can write about this small place and I think you can make it relevant I think you can make it large I think you can make it the literature can be about a lot more than that place. Um, I just don't see it as a limit. I don't see it as a limit to to excellence, to um, to anything, um, really. So I wouldn't. But for me as well, I think a big part of writing is voice. Um, so I've been living in Scotland for five years now. And I probably couldn't write a story about Scotland. And it's not that Scotland in its own way doesn't feel like home. But I don't speak with a Scottish accent. And if I don't speak... If I don't have that voice, I can't write it. I can't write a place unless I believe that I control the voice of it. And so I could never write Scotland. Um, but I could always write the Caribbean. Because not only do I feel I know the voice, but I can... It's more than knowing the voices that I can write it and I can do something with it that even a speaker can't do with it. Um, I, I can manipulate it on the page to make it do things. Uh, and I can't do that to, to a Scottish accent. Um, so probably more than anything, that it, it's, it's my limit. that I, I can only work with the voice I have in my head. So, as long as you have the voice, yeah. you have the inspiration. Yeah. And you will have the story. Yeah. So if one day another voice comes in my head, definitely. Um, it's it's probably more about that. Once I once I know a voice, and I feel I can write it, then I would write the story. Uh, which is your greater love, poetry or novel fictional literature? In your writing. Neither. Um, I'm not even. My greatest love is this thing I am presently writing, whichever genre that is. Um, I don't know, I've never... Genre for me is a shape. Um, I like writing. I have projects that I want to write. And they take on different... Uh, and I'm very different from, from other writers like that. But yeah, they take on different shapes. And... Uh, and so there's a thing, there's a project that I want to work on, and for me, a, a big part of that is figuring out what is the shape of this project. Does it take the shape of an essay? Does it take the shape of a novel? Does it take the shape of a short story? Does it take the shape of a poem? But so it, these are just shapes. Yeah. The the voice is the same, and you choose the shape. Yeah. On based on what do you want to express more or what comes more in handy what comes first no it's it's more what the thing wants to do um, so for instance an, an essay has a thesis an essay has a point that it wants to make I don't believe poems have points that they want to make that would be too preachy and so if there's a point I want to make um, then it will probably become an essay. If there is a story that I want to tell, it will always be a novel or a short story. It will never be a poem. I don't want to tell poems. I don't want to tell stories in poems. Um, but if there is something that I want to do with language, um, then it's 
then it's a poem. So the cartographer tries to map away to Zion. It, I mean, the, and it's not saying that any of these things are exclusively, but what is the main thing that I want to do? And in that, it's the language of, of Rastafari, which is so kind of um, spiritual um, and lovely. It meets this very scientific language of cartography. And the two things clash, you know, the scientific language versus the um, the spiritual language. And I wonder how, in that dissonance, can I make music? So what poetry is always doing. Poetry is always finding two disparate things, finding things that create dissonance, and trying to find a music out of it. And once those two voices were in my head, I knew that that was that was a poetry collection. Um, so yeah, I, I think I just have to sit down and think what does, what is this project trying to do and what, what form would best highlight those things. Yeah. So, uh, last but not least, a thought for hyperliteratura readers and followers. Uh, and an advice for all emerging writers, what would you say? Uh, the, the, the same thing that every writer I know says, read. Read a lot more, but also, um, I would say don't waste time reading what you don't like. Um, you know, there's, there's often that idea that, you know, read. Um, you know, you should read this and you should read that, and I never... I, I don't agree with that at all. You should, you should read and read and read until you find that one thing that you're insanely passionate about, and then read it again, and then read it again, and read that thing again, and figure out why you felt so passionately about that. Because if you waste time reading things that you feel that everyone is saying, this is a classic, you should read it, and it doesn't move you, um, then you're going to get frustrated. Um, it's not going to inspire you. It's, it's not going to do anything for, for you as a writer. It's not, it's not helping you to find your voice. But the thing that you feel passionate about, you probably feel passionate because it connects with something that you want to do. And that's the thing you should concentrate on. So yeah, I'd say read a lot. But don't waste time yet with the things you don't like. And, and oftentimes I find with writing, if you spend the time on the things you love, and you, let, and you let that lead you to something else that you might like. Oftentimes you come back to the thing you thought you didn't like at first. And you realize now you suddenly like it. Um, because you understand it at a different level. Yeah, but you have to come to it at your own time. Um, so, so yeah, so, so that would be my bet. Don't waste, time with, don't, don't waste time with things you don't like. Thank you very much. No, thanks for having me. <laughs> Alright. Meanwhile, I gotta take this off and then.